From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are sheltering in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Well, you know what season it is. All of us were late at night watching the action in New Zealand for the 36th America's Cup. At the beginning of every America's Cup, there is always chatter about how crazy the yachts look and how the newest technology may be upstaging the sailors. But Cup historians know that the America's Cup is more than just a boat race. From its inception in 1851, the competition has always had three elements, kind of like a triathlon. There is enterprise, you must have or raise vast amounts of money. There is technology, you must use that money wisely to make the best, fastest possible yachts. And lastly, there is sailing, you must sail those yachts exceptionally well. It's impossible to win the cup unless you're truly brilliant in at least two, and usually winners are fantastic at all three. So we offer this quick review of 10 tech innovations in America's Cup history. Starting in 1851, the Yacht America, which gave the cup its name, was so radical that the first Englishmen who saw her were shocked. The Marquis de Angli said, if she is right, then we are all wrong. America had a clipper bow, very sharp bow. She used long American cotton fiber sailcloth, which made her sails hold up better when they got wet, so they held up better under a breeze. And her raked mast reduced the length of her leeches, which were the flappiest part of sails in those days. So she held up much better uh, in a breeze. Of course, underwater, she seemed completely the opposite of the English cutter, uh, where they thought it was better to be have a cod's head and a mackerel tail. This is the underwater section, and the black is the above water section of a traditional English cutter. The Yacht America, by contrast, had a mackerel head and a cod's tail. The Yacht Defender was a majestic yacht. And underwater, you'll recognize her. She looks like a yacht from the 30s. So she was literally, you know, decades ahead of her time with a bulbous fin keel and whole construction of multiple metals, aluminum and bronze and steel. It made her kind of a natural magnet, which meant she didn't last very long. But she was a pioneering, beautiful creature. And her hourglass shape came to epitomize beautiful yachts for decades. In the early 30s, the J boats introduced uh, Marconi or Bermuda rigs, no more gaff headed sails, and they took care of a stretch at the bottom of the mainsails with Park Avenue booms, T shaped booms you could actually walk on, and then in 34 with very, very bendy booms, which would stretch the shape out of the bottom of the main and help the sail curve better, uh, making it more aerodynamic. In 67, Intrepid broke the rudder away from the back of the keel and had a separate rudder. What, what used to be the rudder turned into a trim tab that you adjusted less frequently than the actual rudder you steered the boat with. Intrepid was revolutionary also in 1970 with a lightweight boron composite boom and a spinnaker pole so light that one person could lift it. Intrepid, one of three yachts that would race in two America's Cups. Of course, in 1980, Freedom won with the first flexible Kevlar sailcloth. There'd been Kevlar for eight or so years, but when you folded the early Kevlar, it broke easily and didn't wear well. Freedom had a flexible Kevlar sailcloth and Mylar laminated sails that held up very well, and she was seen as completely radical when these were first introduced. And of course, um, a famously radical boat, Australia 2, had the winged keel. They had an in-plate effect and got more weight out on the keels without making the bottom of it even more bulbous with these winglets, taking an aerodynamic concept and applying it to hydrodynamics. And they had a triradial 
a mainsail and jib. 1987. America's loss of the cup in 83 provided San Francisco with our first ever opportunity to challenge for the old mug. Since we were in catch up mode from the start, we declared we would telescope time with technology and we separated the keel from the lifting foils and tried to specialize the function of each. We lowered the mass of the keel with a squished ellipsoid and we turned the old trim tab into a separate foil and moved it from the back edge of the keel to the bow of the boat. And while our bow rudder was less effective when it came out of the water in the big swell off of Fremantle, we beat the powerful challenge from New York and the ultimate winner from San Diego in the December trials. Steering our innovative beast was the biggest challenge. Kenny Keefe and the boys feverishly MacGyvered steering poles from one end of the boat to the other under the deck. And we were experimenting with two different steering modes. We had a collective mode and we had a cyclical mode. But while we were doing all that experimenting, Dennis made other improvements to his boat and he ultimately beat us in the semifinals. Our final analysis showed that we were faster than everybody but Dennis Connor in Perth. But as we all know, in the America's Cup, there is no second. In summary, we were first time challengers with an innovative idea that ran out of time. But Tom's words during that cup cycle would prove prophetic. 13 on the rachel meter. Okay, you guys got, we squared away on this pack. You ever heard that defender dog go 8-3 upwind? You ever hear 8-3? Not once. Not once. <laughs> Yes. A lot of times you're just sitting around waiting for something to happen. And, you know, you're grinding along with another boat going six miles an hour for 15, 20 minutes saying, oh, I think we gained 10 feet. Pro sail is, whoo, bam, crash, cross, look out for this guy, ram, wham. I like that. Better. And we have six legs in the course, so you're always going around the mark. and. You're always having boats whizzing past you one way or the other. It's just something that I like. Alan Bond came up to us on the stage while we were announcing America's Cup, and he said, the America's Cup ought to be in the fastest boats, in the most high-tech boats that they are. They ought to be 85-foot maxis. And I said, Alan, the fastest boats are catamarans. What about catamarans? Says, catamarans? No, no. Two of those big cats racing against each other, just with the, with the pedal to the metal and flying hulls and putting big sails up, could be extremely exciting in 15 knots to win. Stars and Stripes in 88, responding to the deed of gift challenged by uh, the big boat Michael Fay uh, challenged with. Uh, they introduced the first catamaran design and a wing sail, an incredibly powerful and dramatic wing sail, quite an innovation. In 2010, USA 17's wing sail would camp to weather and both of the multi-holes that year, the catamaran by Olingi and the trimaran by USA, uh, partially foiled. It's said that there was 50 tons of load, lateral load on the foils on USA 17. Uh, this picture was taken by a dear friend and America's Cup historian, uh, Steve Tishia, uh, who, who's gonna give a talk at the Yacht Club in a couple of months. Um, He's very, very insightful, and this is a brilliant shot. It shows the, um, you know, partially foiling USA 17. And when you got close to USA 17, she didn't really look like a yacht. She looked really like a spaceship or some kind of incredibly scientific uh, creature skittering across the water at incredible speeds. We all got to see up close in 2013 fully foiling catamarans. The Kiwis were the first to foil down under and kind of tried to keep it a secret. Uh, some challenges up in San Francisco didn't think they could foil an Oracle, which was relentless, uh, wouldn't let up. And, and of course, as we all know, when nine races straight, foiling through tacks and jibes and getting better and better and better at foiling, it was a just dramatically beautiful sight to see. Their wing was incredible, of course. They had two main sections with a slot between the forward and the after section. And, uh, you know, there were nine separate elements. It could be trimmed dramatically and had way less main sheet load than a soft sail. So these are 10 tech innovations to this point. And so our guest today, America's Cup winner, America's Cup Hall of Fame member, Sailing Hall of Fame member, and the comment commentator who suggested in our last Wednesday Yachting 
luncheon that the score would be New Zealand seven and Italy three. Now let's see. It seems to me that I owe you a beer, Gary Jobson. <laughs> Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Well, thank you very much. And the next time at the bar at St. Francis, I'll collect that beer. Uh, it was a great series. And the America's Cup is always full of surprises. And I do have to smile. Uh, you know, my early prediction was that the Kiwis would win seven to three. And that's actually what happened. Uh, there were some reasons for that, but let's be honest. Uh, maybe there's a little luck involved as, with that as well. But I'll take it. And uh, it was a good match. And uh, the only problem for me is I'm on the Eastern time zone here in the United States in Annapolis, Maryland. And with the uh, daylight savings clock changed, these races weren't getting up underway until about 11.15 at night. But there was often delays making it later than that. So anybody that was interested in watching it live, uh, it was a late night or conversely an early morning. So I'm gonna show a little video and I got some highlights to look at, but Ron, I, I wanted to start with uh, something just to mention. So I was last uh, at the club for Yachtsman's Luncheon back in December of 2018. Boy, does time go by uh, yes. two and a quarter years ago. And I talked about a book that I had was writing at the time, which I finished. Here it is. The great, great book. I'm reading it. It's fantastic, Gary. The Legends of American Sailing. And I just wanted to point out that uh, there's several great San Francisco sailors that I got to write about, including the late, great Thomas David Blackhaller Jr., Paul Kayar, John Kostecki, Stan Honey, Sally Honey, um, are all in the book and, and another uh, 45 or so sailors from around the United States. And one of the things that I learned about all these sailors is generally they started very early in life in the sport of sailing. They continued on for a long period of time all the way through their lives. Most of them are older now. And uh, along the way, every single person had some kind of adversity and they had to overcome that. And Emirates Team New Zealand is one of those examples. Let's not forget, and you and I were right there in September of 2013, where here they are up eight to one. They had to win one more measly 20, 25 minute race up and down the bay. And they had eight shots at it and they ended up losing. It was a dramatic finish that you can imagine what it did to the Kiwi psyche it's kind of the equivalent of the United States beating Canada in hockey, for example. Miracle on ice. Right. So uh, that was in their head. But boy, have the New Zealanders learned how to win this thing. And they do it on an awful lot of fronts. And they were tested. Italy was good. Uh, Jimmy Spittle and Francesco Bruni, they, they sailed well. They were a good boat. And to beat Bain in Ben Ainsley and the British 7-1, uh, to one, in the uh, Prada Cup final and uh, make mincemeat out of the New York Yacht Club in four straight races, really spoke that they were the challenger that de deserved to be in the cup. And what a start, my goodness. Uh, three days in a row, we're trading races. The scores one to one, two to two, three to three. And the breakthrough came in on that fourth day, kind of a goofy day for sailing with the wind uh, oscillating back and forth all over the map and the velocity going up and down and the Kiwis finding a way to come from behind and win those races. And probably the most defining moment was in race eight. We're going to argue for a long time in sailors bars and at the, at St. Francis that maybe the uh, race should have been abandoned that part, but it's hard to do, but the Italians ahead by a length and uh, one leg to go. You right. can't do it then, but they got off the foils, the wind died, and New Zealand got some new wind and got rolling. It was uh, quite an extraordinary thing. So, as I mentioned, for American Magic, great disappointment. Many of us were really hoping they'd win, so that you'd return the cup to Newport, Rhode Island, and I sure hope to see it there someday during my lifetime. But it's been gone a long time almost 38 years, 1983, when uh, Dennis Conner lost it to the Australians. 
American Magic simply was not able to improve from one round to the next. So they looked reasonably good in the early round. They had a four and two record. They beat New Zealand in one race. But from that point on, they never really got going. And they had some severe weaknesses, unable to get off to the starting, off the starting line, uneven tactics coming off the foils. And probably the most dramatic moment at all is when they uh, launched into the air, cracked down hard, capsized the boat, damaged their equipment, the hydraulics, water log, the instruments. Anyway, they had a heroic job getting the boat back on the water, but they were no match for uh, the Parada Pirelli team by that point. And that was the end of American magic. To summarize the cost of the capsize. In other words, obviously, it cost them some time, but it cost them practice. And you and I know every time there's a new design, time in the boat is a big deal. Um, so well, they, they, they were able to sail for about a day and a half after I think about 13 days of working on the boat. But you know, they had a hole on the boat. They had uh, all kinds of structural issues. The hydraulic system was messed up and they went over to the tune-up boat Defiant to use some parts there. All the electronics, the computers were waterlogged and unusual, unusable, and and they were now practicing. You know that's a bad combination when the right. other guys are out sailing every day, right? And so the combination of that doomed American Magic. And you know I don't know if they're going to do it again or not. We will see. But they do have a lot of assets, and they can build on that experience. But I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, discussions. So. As I was saying, the weather is always a factor. And there's an old expression, I'm sure you've heard this, Ron, that in a big regatta, somebody will inevitably say, you know, the wind's not normally like this here, you know. <laughs> I mean, it just, Ever the bigger regatta, the more likely the wind is not what it's been expected. <laughs> I think for the America's Cup, the wind was generally lighter than they thought. They did race late in the afternoon, four o'clock local time. Uh, which here in Annapolis, you know, we're just getting ready for the Wednesday night series at four in the afternoon, 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, but the wind was a little bit lighter, which probably played havoc because I think the teams were probably prepared for a little bit more breeze than when we saw in the America's Cup. And there were wind shifts. So whether you're going uh, eight knots upwind or 44 knots upwind, a wind shift is a wind shift and you want to take advantage. Unfortunately, this race course, which I'm not as enamored with as some others, seemed to be very hard to pass. I thought the boundaries were a little bit too narrow and the legs a little bit too short. You know, it took three to three and a half minutes to get downwind and four and a half, maybe five minutes to get upwind. That's pretty, that's kind of, even collegiate racing is longer than that. So the passing lanes were rare. So if you wanted to start and got ahead, generally you would stay ahead. And that makes the New Zealand victory so remarkable because they were able to find a way when they were behind to get ahead. Right. Very difficult to do. And right. they were able to do that. Right. Another lesson that we learned is veteran campaigns are difficult to beat. Let's face it, the Italians have been in operation for since 1983. Right. And this uh, product group has been going since 2000. Uh, where they made the America's Cup final, by the way, uh, and they're losing to New Zealand, but they've been operating a long time. And even Team New Zealand started up, I think, back in 1985, and remnants of those grew. I mean, generations are going by now, but they just keep getting better. They also have been really good from the beginning, but it had all these heartbreak losses. You and I remember them in Perth, where they were really, they were like a 12 and Oh, at one point, you know, 12 and one, and they were rolling really well in, uh, as well in 92. Uh, and when Kayard protested over the bowsprit, remember that? And they were doing incredibly well in both of those series. In both of them, they, uh, their results looked like a bowling ball rolling off a table. Well, you know, you wonder, well, you're always smart after sailboat races. I am anyway, you know, if I should have gone to the east side of the course, you're, but I think the lesson for New Zealand is you have to have a superstar, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, uh, Stefan Curry type on your team 
steering these boats. And New Zealand won when they got Russell Coots, Sir Russell Coots, Olympic gold medalist, an unbelievably driven guy. And Peter Burling, same thing, Olympic gold medalist. Both of them have degrees in engineering. They're very comfortable with technology and translating the art of, of sailing with the science of sailing and putting it together, not phased by any adverse uh, pressures on them or adversity. And, and really that was the difference to having Peter Burling, who's probably the best in the world right now in the sport of sailing. I mean, my goodness, look at his record. Right. Olympic silver, uh, I think he was 19 years old or 20 years old, and then Olympic gold the next time, uh, at least four world championships in the 49er class, a world championship in a second in the foiling moss. Right. Clobber right. the uh, Americans, Larry Ellison's team in Bermuda in 2017, seven to one. Right. Uh, did took a almost the worst boat in the Volvo Ocean Race and got it just about to the top of the fleet, uh, joining it at, after a few legs. So the guy is really good. And his supporting cast of Glenn Ashby, uh, Olympic medalist, a multiple time world champion, and catamarans going through his third America's Cup. And of course, his longtime mate, Blair Took. Uh, anyway, so the sailors made a difference. And uh, happily, it was a sailor's regatta, you know, playing wind shifts and getting out of phase and taking your opportunities made the difference. Uh, and as you can imagine, there were a lot of emotions out there. I mean, when you had a chance to listen on board, and I'm a little bit of criticism here, because I thought yeah. the commentators over talked the competitors way too much. There was a lot of uh, emotions out there on the water. And it's too bad we couldn't see their faces with the helmets and heads down grinding the winches, because uh, we could have seen a lot more. Especially the decisive I moments when, uh, when uh, Italy bounces New Zealand right into what we're all imagining is more breeze in the upper right hand corner in that uh, second upwind leg. There are several moments, the axial moment when you wouldn't it have been wonderful to hear the discussion back and forth. What do you think? Yeah, should we continue on port? We could cross or what? Those moments are always really interesting to analyze later. You know, Spithill at that point said, well, should I tack here or keep going? You know, should I tack here was the question. And the answer came, yeah, let's tack on them. Well, really, that, that that was probably the biggest mistake of the entire series, right? Because you could see more wind on the water to the right. I mean, we have the advantage of being up in the air and all the right. things that they don't see. But there was more wind on the right side of the course. And if you can cross, and if you can cross on port, you got rights later. And then you have the starboard advantage. So even if you lose a length or two, you've right. got the starboard advantage, which. <laughs> You know, like a chess game, the queen is powerful and starboard advantage is uh, equally as powerful. And they gave that up to tack on them. And of course, New Zealand tacked right back to port. And that was the difference in the race. And I'm, I'm sure those guys will be replaying that moment in their heads for many years from now. Just like I bet you Dennis Conner still thinking about whether he should have covered a little closer in <laughs> Lake five of race seven in 1983. I discussed so, that, yes. <laughs> but Ron, I do want to say- I actually that, asked Whitten if Halsey suggested that they jibe on the port. I discussed that with Tom Whitten in an upcoming Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And Whitten says, no, he only says Halsey made that call in public. But in truth, he actually wanted to go left down the, down the breeze as well. And he gave a good explanation. So you and I are both got big smiles on, on that story as well. But I agree completely with your point that we don't really need to hear from the commentators or analysts if in reality we can hear it from the horse's mouth. If we can actually hear the debate on the boat on what later on turns out to be a pivotal, you know, a match point kind of move. And that would have been great to actually replay over and over their process, what their what they said back and forth to each other when they made this decisive. And as it turns out to be, sorry to say, it's because they're all genius sailors, but bad choice. Yeah, I mean Nathan Outridge every now and said, "Let's listen on board," and then the other commentator would jump right in. You know, it's like anyway that 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 is a criticism and. I, you know, I'm sensitive. I've done a lot of commentary myself over the years, and I know what it's like when everybody's picking on you all the time. But the <laughs> fact is, 
we had microphones on the boats and it would have been nice to hear more of them while they were racing, which is very unique in sports. You don't really get in the huddle in a football game. And here we could be inside the, the fuddle. Now, I wanted to make a point that Italy did benefit from having 24 races before they faced New Zealand. And New Zealand got their six races in that America's Cup World Series slash Christmas regatta. But that was it. They were on their own for a long period of time where, you know, let's face it, Italy was tested in the round robins and up against American Magic. And, you know, the races weren't that easy uh, up against the British, Ineos. And uh, I think that probably did help them. And Burling even said in the post-race press conference after their first day that he felt a little rusty. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, uh, you know, that's quite an admission because you don't, generally want to say you're rusty when you're sailing uh, in an America's Cup or in a Super Bowl, but they were, but they sure got better as time went on. So just a couple more things. We're going to go to the video. So Italy's strengths were good funding, better funding than New Zealand, national pride. It was big news in Italy. That always uh, gives you some strength. They had a season helmsman with Spithill splitting half the time. But he'd been through the cup, winning and losing. That's got a lot of value. They were really good on the starts. And that helped them a lot, particularly in those first six races. You win the start, you win the race. Uh, they showed steady progress. Every round, they got a little better, a little better. Uh, they seemed to be fast in all conditions. Uh, Bruni was a good tactician. They had pretty much flawless boat handling and maneuvers and mark roundings. And uh, that was good. Weaknesses, they have a demanding owner back in Italy, probably a little frustrated. Patricio Bertelli was not on the scene. Uh, maybe they're a little slower in the lighter wind. They seem to have a little bit struggle staying on the foils, which was their undoing in that critical race, uh, the light air race. Um, and, you know, the, the Italians have been to the America's Cup finals twice. They lost zero to five against New Zealand in 2000, and here they lost seven. So that's a little bit tough. And then one more little thing before the video, uh, New Zealand. So like I said, continuous operation since 1985. They understand foiling, we've learned that. They're uh, efficient with technology and foiling, and I think we're gonna learn more about that in the coming months. They learn how to overcome adversity, that loss in 2013. And as you pointed out, in uh, 1992, well, 1987, 98, 92 were tough lessons, but they got coots and looked a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe New Zealand had a little financial pressures. I don't think they had as abundant funding as some of the other teams. And, you know, sailing at home, plays both ways. Yeah, you're familiar with the waters, but boy, those Kiwis sure have a high expectations. And if they had been down five to three, that would have been tough. We didn't get to see that. Uh, and they had to deal with all kinds of uh, distractions, which I'm sure were annoying. But like I said, they had Peter Burling and Glenn Ashby and uh, maybe less wear and tear on their boat. So those are some of the pros and cons of Italy and New Zealand. So Gary, after six races, it's tied up 3-3. Three, three. The Kiwis win race seven, but things start to show in the with the eighth race. At that point in the regatta, most people thought, oh my goodness, this is gonna go back and forth all the way to the end to race seven. But now the score is up four to three, as you point out, and things changed. It was a very strange race in race eight. In fact, one time uh, Luna Rosa was about a leg ahead and cruising to an easy victory, but the wind was very unsteady, both in direction and strength. And Luna Rosa, even with the big lead, fell off its foils and couldn't get going again. To try and get up back on the foils, they went out of bounds. They were getting penalized over and over. And New Zealand, showing great patience, got into the wind. They're going 28 knots, and the Italians are going, I think, eight knots or something, and uh, the New Zealanders win. You know, earlier uh, in the regatta, after the first day, 
Peter Burling, the skipper at Emirates Team New Zealand, said, we're a little rusty. And who can blame them? They hadn't had a real race since December. But they weren't rusty anymore. And I think that win was an uh, important moment. So let's go on to race nine. Race nine is interesting because the Italians are in control. They go through four legs and tactically they're right on target. Uh, maybe New Zealand's pushing on them with a little bit more speed, but as we've learned, once you get ahead, very difficult to pass with these uh, narrow boundaries. But on the fifth leg going to windward, New Zealand keeps the pressure on and they're about uh, two thirds of the way up the windward leg. This is leg five now. And the Italians are ahead, crossing by about two and a half boat lengths or so. And they have a decision. They're basically in the middle of the course. Do they tack on top of New Zealand and force them to the right? Or do they cross and get to the right and maintain that starboard advantage? Starboard advantage is very important because you've got the right of way. So the real issue is do you cover or do you go for different win? Well, those of us watching uh, on TV could see a little darker patch to the right. That's the advantage of uh, having aerials, which they don't have aboard the boats. But there was more wind to the right. And I must say, uh, I bet Burling and Tuke and Ashby and company on the New Zealand boat were mighty ha happy when Spithill comes across and tacks on them, forcing New Zealand to the right, but getting them out of phase and giving them a lane. And sure enough, they got very close to that boundary on the right side. This is New Zealand now. The wind shifted uh, 12 degrees. It was quite a lot. Right. And uh, they got into it. So the Italians not only were in lighter air, but when they finally tacked back on the port, they were on a very low course. And New Zealand was aimed at the mark. And that now gave a uh, commanding win in race nine. So the score uh, is getting kind of dangerous for the Italians. And three, holy cow, yeah. yeah. And then, then after that, uh, you know, New Zealand got in control and did a better job in the starting. So New Zealand played its way into shape up until this point. And with this victory, it would give them a six to three cushion. So the Italians would have to win four races in a row against a boat that's a little bit faster. So there were some key moments there and the Italians had to be a little bit more aggressive tactically, but that last uh, tack there in the ninth race, had they crossed ahead of New Zealand, this is Italy crossed ahead and gotten that right ship, they would have, I'm sure, won that race. And uh, the score would have been five to four. So you know, maybe a different dynamic. But once they got down six to three, you know, it's it's tough to win at that point. So congratulations to Emirates Team New Zealand. Great job. They uh, win the America's Cup in Bermuda. They defend America's Cup. And one last point here, I've been keeping track of this and the trend is pretty interesting. You challenge and you win, you defend, one time, and then you lose it. So if that continues on, like we saw with uh, Ellison, and we saw with the Lingy, uh, and we saw with the Kiwis before, they're gonna lose the next time around. So maybe <laughs> some incentive for some challengers that, okay, uh, maybe they got comfortable, maybe financing is tough, now, we do know that the Royal Yacht Squadron, Ben Ainsley and company, are going to be the challenger of record, which tells me next time around, we're going to see foiling monoholes again. I don't know when they're going to have the event, but I bet it's within two or three years rather quickly. And the question is, can any teams get organized and raise the massive amount of money you'll need to be prepared? Now, clearly, the Italians and New York Yacht Club have a lot of equipment. So somebody could either buy their stuff or they could uh, rebound and try again. But for a team starting from scratch, it's gonna be quite a tall ask 
So I think both the challenge of record and the defender are going to have to think hard. What are they going to have to do to attract more teams? Because clearly, three challengers and one defender is not enough. When we were in uh, Australia, we were all younger, Ron, but when we were in Australia <laughs> in 86 and 87, I'd say, I mean, there were 13 challengers from seven countries and there were four defenders. So, I mean, that, that's uh, 17 teams were there. Right. And uh, really that's what the America's Cup needs is more participation, not three challengers and one defender. So speak to that issue. Um, if you kept the same boats, you and I know every time you change boat, you increase the cost for somebody new to get in. If you kept the same uh, general protocol boat, um, you would be able to have some used boats that people could buy to get rolling. Uh, so what are the three or four things you could do right off the bat, you know, that would increase the number of pr participants in the next cup in cup 37? Well, the first thing is to give it some time. So I would say a minimum of three years, maybe even four for the next cup. So you can get, people can have time to A, raise the money. There are some used boats around. New York's got two of them. Ineos has got two of them. And the Italians have two of them. So maybe some of those boats uh, could go to another team. But, you know, should there be a salary cap to try and make it cost less? Should you limit the number of, times or days that you can race in advance of the cup. I mean, if the thing costs less, you're going to have more challengers. And if you have enough time to organize the team, uh, you'll, you'll have more challengers. If they go again in two years, it's going to be very tough for uh, a teams to get organized. But we don't know. And it'll be great speculation. But I think a lot of these decisions will happen very quickly. It will owe a lot more in the near future. So Gary, uh, what a great analysis. So one of the interesting aspects of this cup was because the boats were so fast, 30s, 40s, you know, I saw, I didn't see it. Yeah, right up there at the top. What that meant is that the starting process was in a way more complex because, you know, you and I are used to looking at my old lead mine IOD youngster. She goes, you know, six seconds of length. <laughs> well, these boats- one length and six seconds. These boats go a length in two seconds. Look, or or they could go slower. You and I see them go down to like you know twenty two, or they go to thirty five, and so the starting process had lots of complexity to it, which I I brought I thought brought a lot of interest to the game. Um, yeah, so talk about talk about the complexity of sailing these boats and how that influenced the competition. Well, the boats were extremely complex, and uh, unlike all the other America's Cup boats in the past, I've never sailed on one of these things. I'd certainly like to get a ride, and, uh, you know, I think back to the great skippers of the past, how they would handle these boats, and my answer is they probably would handle them pretty darn well, uh, just like these uh, guys have been able to do. If you wanted to improve these, uh, the America's Cup, I would do a couple things. I would have a little bit longer legs, so you spend more time. I would have certainly either no boundaries or much wider boundaries so that you have a better opportunity to pass. I think that would be good. Uh, it's a little disappointing not to have downwind sails like Jennikers or Code Zeros or Spinnakers. Uh, and it's a shame we don't actually see the competitors. You know, I, I wanna see faces and emotions to go along with those voices. NBC and ESPN have certainly done a good job showing us sports and what makes it compelling, you know, up, up close and personal is seeing faces, seeing emotions, hearing what people have to say. And that was missing. We could hear a little bit about what was going on in the boat, but we couldn't see any emotions, any faces, any grimaces, any pieces of pain, any elation. Uh, you know, none of that was missing. And that was one of the really cool things with uh, the onboard cameras when we were in Fremantle. We could feel the crews or on the, the Whitbread or the Volvo Ocean Race, you know, you could see these people steering in their emotions in the Southern Ocean, KR going down those waves. I mean, that was compelling uh, to see all that stuff. And all that was missing. We saw a bunch of top of heads and occasionally a shot of the helmsman with his hands gripping on the, but it, it wasn't enough. It wasn't compelling. So, you know, but you know, all these helmets, you, you look more like a 
race car kind of wedged in a little bit more or an astronaut up in one of those tiny capsules being launched in a space as opposed to being on a sailboat, which is outdoors and vibrant and sailing's emotional. You know, a lot happens out there in the race course, good and bad, every single race, never, it's never perfect. And we want to experience that and we didn't. Mm -hmm. But you know, everybody's huddled down, keeping windage down, stability maybe, I don't know. Uh, but with helmets and all the jackets on, you, you can't really see anybody. And that, I think that takes a away a little bit for it. Uh, more racing would be good. You know, we could sp spread out a little bit. It'd be uh, quite a show to see these things on San Francisco Bay. You know, having seen American Magic in person up in Narragansett Bay in 2019, it's quite a sight when these guys come roaring by you know, I'm on a 12 meter going upwind at 8.6 knots or downwind on a good day at 11.8 knots. <laughs> These things come flying by at 44 knots or so. It's, it's pretty mind boggling. And uh, although the 12 meters are, they're such great boats, you know, and the, the reason they're, they survive so long is because they're fun to sail. You know, they're an interesting boat and a lot of technology in them too and great tactics and, you know, makes good thinking. These boats, you got to think fast. So I, I would also probably put a little bit more time in the starting area. You know, two ten and two minutes is not much time. And if you added a minute, one minute, you know, there'd be some more possibilities of jostling that uh, goes on during the starting line. But these are all fine tuning things that, uh, you know, you couldn't change during the heat of battle because they'd already agreed to it. But surely you can open things up for the next round. I had another question. I kept noticing that uh, either whether they're entering on port or starboard, they weren't entering right on the money like we used to in 12 meter days. They were entering three seconds, two, four seconds, sometimes late. What was that all about? Why is that? Especially if you're the port tack boat, you've got the 10 second advantage. You, it seems to me you want to enter right on the money. And even though these boats have such a speed range, you could argue it's just that much harder. Then again, these are great sailors. They really had great sailors on the boats. Yeah. Well, first of all, they're all new to sailing these boats, so you don't have your timing down perfect. Secondly, the penalty for being early is dramatic, getting a penalty. So I'd rather be three or four seconds late than one second early. So I think there was some conservatism there. And then, uh, you know, they're looking at the other boat. Are they early or late? You know, maybe you want to try and be as close. If he's going to be late on the other on starboard, I'm going to be a little late myself. So I, I'm a little bit closer. So I would say gamesmanship, not so familiar with the boat, fluctuations in the wind, uh, we're probably making the difference there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the learning curve on these boats, we've watched it as each time there's a new cup design, you have learning curve on the boats. Uh, it seemed to me that the Kiwis somehow or another, even though they weren't racing as much, they didn't have an elimination trials, they they were pretty doggone savvy. When you talk about getting the, they both fell off their foils, and I guess it was race eight. First the Kiwis fell off their foils, and then the Italians, but the Kiwis got it up again. You know, they learned faster about how to get the boat out of the water again. You know, Sperry Topsider was a sponsor of uh, the New Zealand boat that year, and all the television cameras focused on Peter Blake's kind of odd red socks and uh, Sperry Topsider got an awful lot of publicity with the cameras <laughs> angling on the socks and the shoes that he was wearing. I, I think, I don't think it was a marketing ploy that they planned, but it sure worked out well. I was in their compound when they won in San Diego and he took his socks off. And let me tell you, it's not, oh. it wasn't a good thing to be anywhere close. He was a great leader. Was he and, a great leader? Uh, I know Blake and Grant Dalton were uh, unbelievable rivals. But let's give Blake some credit here. He set up this system that took him from not being able to win to win in 95 and defending in uh, 2000. And then we lost Peter Blake, uh, the tragedy in the Amazon River in Brazil. And, uh, and, they, and they ended up losing the cup. You know, I wondered if Blake had been around, whether they would have found a way to keep Russell Coots in New Zealand instead, instead of going to uh, Switzerland. We'll never know that. But that was a that was something that made a big difference. So let me ask about another trend. You mentioned the successful challenge, successful defense, and then the the pattern of losing it after that. 
yes. there's another pattern. And that pattern is if you've got Kiwis, you're winning the AC since 2000. You and I've seen it. <clears throat> In 95, they win with Kiwis. 2000, they win with Kiwis. <clears throat> when the Swiss win, they've got the principal Kiwis on their team. So a more powerful pattern is um, you got to have that little small island down there. Um, you know, as part of your program. What about that? Well, I, I would also point out that Glenn Ashby is an Australian, the wing trimmer who uh, had a lot of influence on that Kiwi team. You know, I, I, I bet in the back of his head, he's, why aren't we getting an Australian boat? We can do this. You know, I went to uh, what was called the Citizens Cup, a watch company at the time. Uh, in 1985 in New Zealand. And there were three New Zealand teams. There were seven of us skippers from around the world. And there were three New Zealand teams. And we all had local crews. And New Zealand ended up eighth, ninth, and tenth. But they went on to quite a development program to improve their match racing skills, recruiting all kinds of young people. Brad Butterby at Worth being one of them, Russell Coots being another one. Dean Barker a little after that, they worked at it and they got better and better. And along the way, they developed great skippers and great crew. And the America's Cup really should be a friendly competition between foreign countries. And if you want to get people watching, you put all Americans on the American boat. You put all the French on the French boat and all the New Zealanders on the New Zealand boat. And then you have a legacy to build on last time. As you pointed out, New Zealand wasn't, you know, they, they, they didn't win in 87, they didn't win in 88, and they didn't win in 92. They came close, but they didn't win. But they were building people up that are now the coaches and uh, keeping this alive. And You're Burling, right. what's he, 28 or 29 years old? So yeah, yeah. And remember, he's going to be around for a while. Kevin Shoebridge was in Perth with us. Exactly. Those guys you know, the long-term development program. So, so essentially, um, the defender is less likely than anyone to argue for a nationality rule because they've got a lot of experienced guys who want to basically be um, tempted off, recruited off to other teams. What about a completely neutral governance body? Well, I think the America's Cup as an event has suffered from start and stops and different managers and different protocols and different formats. I mean, since 1987, we've had seven different boats in the cup, eight if you count the big, uh, the big boat and, uh, you know, a trimaran and a catamaran in uh, 2010. That's a lot of changes, you know, even though the new boats are cool, but that's a lot of changing of boats. That 12 meter era went for 10 America's Cups. Yeah, the boats got faster and they improved, but they were all, you know, 12 meters. They were all to the same rule. So the America's Cup should have a commissioning, a, a, a commissioner and a governing body. So no matter where it is in the world, you make things uh, evolve and not these massive changes. I'm writing a book on the history of the e-scout class, and I dove into the history of this class. And in in uh, 2023, it's 100 years these boats have been racing. Wow. The concept came out of the Swana Corinthian Cup with kind of really bizarre scow designs. There was one that's 52 feet long. It must have been a scary thing to be sailing in a breeze. But the e-scout class has done a very clever thing. They welcome change. And if you have a new idea which you for your boat, uh, you can sail with your new idea, but your races won't count. And then if people like it, they'll try it out a little bit more and eventually it'll be put up to be adopted. And so the class has evolved with asymmetrical spinnakers or get rid of spinnaker poles and have sprints or uh, different kinds of spars and rigging and rudder shapes. And all these things evolve slowly over the years, all on the ingenuity that people wanna to try to go faster and then convince others to do it. And for that very reason, the e-scout class is about to celebrate its 100th year of continuous racing since 1913. How many one design classes can say that? That's a very clever idea. So you can trial out the idea. 
-hmm. and basically later on decide if you guys uh, if the if there's a consensus to adopt this improvement and enhancement because you and i know classes like the 14s i sailed international 14s as a kid and the i-14s are so much different now trapezes and the like they're like so much you know and you and i know tech dinghies on the charles you know they keep evolving and so on so that's a very interesting idea as a one design owner, we built a, um, we had a masthead um, shiv put into Youngster. And so we actually have a masthead look for Youngster. And it's really fun and light air that, you know, you can t- turbocharge your one design. So in one design racing, you don't use that. But in uh, other occasions, you have an extra variety inside your boat. I like your idea. That's interesting. I'm going to discuss do, that uh, with somebody. Do what, Ron, do you ever get light air in San Francisco? <laughs> All winter. <laughs> Not all winter, but sometimes in winter. Good question. I know you do. Fair question. Do. Exactly. What about control systems? The Kiwis seem to me were very savvy in specializing the um, flight control functions in Bermuda. They had one person dedicated. That's not what the American team had. This time as well, they had a genius flight control, you know, a parent air sailor, foiler, paying attention to flight controls. And it seemed to me that they... I'm asking about control systems because it was pretty secret what was going on. I spent some time uh, listening to naval architects and they were pretty mum about and they and the Kiwis didn't want any cameras on the boat. But you know and I know that there were monitors all over the place so that people who were sailing the boat could um, they could divvy up the functions more. Talk a little bit about control systems. Well. Clearly, New Zealand got it right. I mean, we don't know precisely what their control system and hydraulics were, but they they got it right. I think it was race six that I think the Italians actually might have had some trouble uh, with their hydraulics with uh, with the foil. They, they certainly didn't talk about their problem, but you could see that they were struggling a little bit with that. Well, it's part of it. You know, there's a lot of technology and a lot of experience, and they keep fine tuning and getting better and they learned in 2013 and they improved in 2017 and they didn't stop. They kept developing for this time around. American Magic, you know, started with a blank piece of paper. That's tough to do to catch up to the other guys who's making adjustments and fine tune. Makes me wonder, you know, is New Zealand gonna send a spacecraft uh, to Mars? You know, or <laughs> put them in the moon? And yeah, they did well in COVID. New Zealand, I, I, I give them a lot of credit. The population in New Zealand is about the same as our state here in Maryland, and we're a relatively small state. We got five and a half million people, about the same they have in New Zealand. And here they're winning the America's Cup, and we do Wednesday night races. There's <laughs> volumes about them down there. <laughs> and they did very well in COVID. Think about that. Their, their female prime minister did a very good job in terms of uh, the fatality rate or the infection rate per capita they're they're really at the top of the game so maybe they benefited by being on an island uh people were coming compared to us with 330 million people and mexico to our south and canada to our north it it was tough but anyway look i've got my covid shot and it seems to be waning and hopefully we're all back in the water and safe and we learn lessons on how to handle a pandemic a little better than we did this past time so if you were out selling and trying to get more company, more countries, countries to, to uh, come play in the cup next cycle, if you did the things that you thought you could keep people in the game, you basically kept the boats the same, what countries would you go, whose doors would you knock on? Well, there are several. I mean, I would look- uh, France? You know, recruiting is, countries are gonna be important. I'd get Japan back in the game. They were very worthy competitors. I would get the Spanish back in the game. They got some darn good sailors in Spain. The French, I mean, look what they did in the Vendee Globe. Talk about impressive. That right. almost impressed me more than the America's Cup, by the way. Uh, going around the world nonstop by yourself and that kind of lunge of all those boats at the finish line. So, you know, I would see the French getting back into it. You know, I've always puzzled why we've never seen a really strong German team. We've seen a few dabble with it. But, you know, so much technology and wealth over there, and they have really great sailors. We could see them. Certainly multiple teams from the U.S. I mean, we've seen that in the past. What, there were five in Australia in uh, 1987 from the U.S., and uh, we had three in New Zealand. So we, we, can, we can get more uh, teams. Brazil, 
you know, they got great designers, Torben Grail and uh, Robert Scheidt. I mean, they got tons of talent down there. And, uh, you know, we could see a South American team. So, you know, New Zealand and uh, Great Britain, they got to think about how to get more teams involved in this thing. And there are countries that can pull it off. And if you look at the performance of, uh, say, the Australians or the Dutch or the French in Olympic competition, there's no reason they can't be at the top of the game in the America's Cup. Great. Gary, it's uh, terrific to get your assessment of the Cup. Um, I can't think of a better analyst to review it, having uh, raced in it multiple times and having won it yourself, and then to basically have such a critical eye to what's going on in the water. Uh, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is uh, very pleased to have you come back as a guest. You're a repeat offender. We, we get to have you come back frequently. Uh, you're very popular on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And uh, I'm looking forward to buying you the beer that you earned. Uh, for those who didn't see last uh, uh, appearance Gary made, he guessed, this is uh, about a month ago, he guessed exactly what the outcome would be. I guessed it would be uh, two to seven uh kiwis over uh italians gary said it would be three to seven italians three kiwis seven which would happen to be exactly what happened so um uh, gary jobson a sailing ambassador great sailor and good bud uh, thanks so much for being a guest on the wednesday yachting luncheon thank you very much ron and the next time i speak at the luncheon i hope it's in person at the yacht club thanks mate good on you mate been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Lunch.